Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, machaba, ciao, bonjour, namaste, jumbo, bienvenidos, hey, my name is Jedley, welcome to Reading With Your Kids. We are coming to you from the oh-so-beautiful, oh-so-wonderful, oh-so-awesome neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so honored and so delighted that you're joining us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. We do that by sharing fun, thoughtful, and thought-provoking conversations with fascinating people who just happen to be writing books for your kids and kids of all ages. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show and let them know that they can hear us on the WREB AM FM 24-7 radio network and they can find us on the iHeartRadio app, Spotify, Apple, Amazon Music, Good Pods, Podcasts, and a CastBox, Player FM, wherever you find your favorite shows. We have two amazing guests. We are so excited. A little bit later on in the show, you are going to be meeting the fascinating Serena Lee, founder of Duck Duck Books and the creator of the book and author app. But first, we're going to be meeting with our friend, the dean of all things STEM and STEAM, Jennifer Swanson. Before we invite Jennifer back into the studio, we have a special message for all adventure seekers. Get ready to embark on an epic journey with author Tim Wright's The Adventures of Toby Baxter Middle Grade series. Join Toby Baxter on his thrilling escapades filled with mystery, friendship, and courage. With two exciting books already in the series, now is the perfect time to catch up before the release of the highly anticipated third installment. Book one in the series, The River Elf, The Giant, and The Closet, is a high-flying middle-grade fantasy. If you love daring journeys, hilarious characters, and heartfelt lessons about confidence, then you'll love book one. Book two is called River Home for the Holidays, and it is a humorous, tongue-in-cheek, middle school age science fiction book. This quest is filled with holiday fun, dangers, and inspiration sure to capture the imaginations of lovers of thriller and fantasy adventures. But the adventures don't stop there. Be prepared for even more excitement in the upcoming release of book number three. Don't miss out on the excitement. Start your adventure today with books one and two and be ready to dive into book three when it hits the shelves. The Adventures of Toby Baxter Middle Grade Series by Tim Wright. They're available wherever books are sold. Oh, I am so excited, my friends. One of my favorite guests is back here on the show. She is celebrating her latest book. It is called The Lost Forest. Please welcome back to the show the dean of all things STEM and STEAM, the Admiral of Adventure, Jennifer Swanson. Oh, my gosh, Jed. It's so wonderful to be back. I've missed you, and oh, my God. I can't believe you still introduced me this way, but wow, thank I, you so much. Well, <laughs> once you become the dean, you you stay the dean. It's just <laughs> college presidents who have to leave. Um, oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> so I have a feeling that I am somewhat familiar with the Lost Forest. Tell our audience all about it, please. Yes, you are, actually. So the title is The Lost Forest, An Unexpected Discovery Beneath the Waves. Mm. So you may remember me talking to you about a story about a secret underwater forest that was found off the coast of Alabama. And it was found by, uh, or it was researched by one of our good friends, Dr. Brian Helmuth Mm -hmm. at Nahant Marine Research Center um, and his team. There there was a whole bunch of them that went down there and they were the only... um, scientists that were able to get a grant from the National Science Foundation, and they um, did their discovery of this forest, and they found out that this forest is made of cypress trees, which means if you go down there, there's there's trees still standing, and they're 60,000 years old. That's crazy. I remember when we were 
doing the Solve It for Kids podcast, which yep. is, if you if you're not listening to Solve It with kids for kids with your kids, you got to do it today. It's available on uh, on on. on Apple and Spotify and all those great places. It is a fantastic podcast. Dr. Brian was one of our first guests, and I remember him telling us about being down there and not being able to see everything, and it's dark and it's murky, and there's trees under the water. Yes. It was like mine exploding. Yes. Well, and and if you remember the very famous quote from Dr. Brian, which is, it was like diving in chocolate milk. Yes, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It's because it's in the place where we have, um, like, the river comes down and then hits the Gulf of Mexico. So there's lots of kind of water movement. And then there's deposits, like silt. So what happens is, is the scientists kind of went down, you know, in the school year. And then they, as soon as they touched the bottom, it was like, ping, all of the silt came up and it clouded the water. It's kind of like when you mix something in your, um, in a glass, mm -hmm. you know, and it doesn't, and, and then it falls to the bottom. You have to wait for it to fall to the bottom. Um, but yes, now, so that your listeners know, these trees are not like trees, trees, like, you know, 20 feet tall, like cypress. Um, but there are some that are about four or five feet tall that are still standing upright. Um, and then there's a lot of smaller stumps and all this kind of stuff. But the cool thing is, is there's there's still a path through the trees. So you can see it 60,000 years later. Wow. Wow. 60,000 years yep. old. Just a couple years older than me. It is amazing. <laughs> It's, it's really amazing. What was it, it, because I don't remember everything about our conversation, but what was it that, that led Dr. Brian and his team to think that they might find this forest under there, or were they just down there taking a stroll and bumped into the tree? So they were not actually the ones that discovered it. It was discovered by a fisherman um, who would take his boat out and then notice that in this one area, there's a lot more fish that he's capturing. And he's kind of like, hmm. So he got a scuba diver to go down. And the thing is, is when there's a lot of fish, that means that there's food. So now that this um, forest has been exposed, lots of little tiny microscopic creatures live there, right? Little creatures that the fish would eat. So that's kind of how they found it. Um, and the reason why it's secret is because they're trying to get this... Um, like national protection for this area so that, say, people that – manufacturers that make wood furniture don't go down and harvest this ancient, ancient forest and build furniture. Wouldn't that be awful? I mean, I think that would be awful. I do think that would be awful. That would be really terrible. And um, well, I'm glad they're keeping it a secret. Yeah. Well, at least at least for now. I think I think kind of the word is getting out a little bit more. Um, you know, in the area that people live around there. But still, I think they're keeping an eye on it. Um, and they they are working through, I believe it's through the House of Representatives. They're trying to get, a, you know, kind of it made a an official sanctuary, protected sanctuary or something like that. Yeah. Why is it important for kids to read a book like The Lost Forest? What kind of, other than just discovering this really cool thing, what kind of benefits can a kid experience from this? So a couple of things. One, it gives you a peek inside what scientists actually do, right? So it literally follows them along their journey and all the different things that they, that they do, how the different dives they go down and they come back up, how some things work and some things don't. Like, for example, they worked really, really hard to pull up this, like, six-foot log and it was like over 200 pounds and they were like we are going to find so many creatures inside this and shipworms which is what they were looking for and they did all of this and they found not one thing <laughs> <laughs> not what they were looking for <laughs> and that's what happens in science but the other big thing about this is discovering this forest tells us a lot about climate change and how the ocean has changed over these 60,000 years, which is past the, the last ice age. 
and it kind of can tell them how far out the land used to go because cypress does not grow underwater. So that means that the you know way back sixty thousand years ago, all of this was above the water line, and that the water has come in since then. So there's so many things, and then they they're looking for these tiny little tiny little creatures called shipworms. And they burrow into the wood, and they eat wood. And there are very few creatures that actually can digest wood because it has cellulose, which is really tough to digest. So in the intestines of these shipworms, they think they might, maybe, be able to find some really cool um, enzymes that they could use for drugs or something to help humans later on. There's wow. there's so many cool things about this. That, you know... For me, just thinking about this under underground uh, underwater forest yeah. to me is cool. But then when you po- add on like how it was discovered, just this curious this this fisherman who was curious and noticing, yeah. hey, this area is different than all of these other places, and I wonder why. Yes. I think that that's such an important lesson to teach kids is to. Be curious and not to be afraid to ask why. Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. That's You know, Jen, that's what I'm all about, being curious and getting out there and learning more. And, again, sometimes it doesn't turn out to be what you want or whatever, but you've learned a whole bunch of stuff along the way, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, if I'm rem- – I, I think I remember Dr. Brian saying that he was down there and it was all murky and mucky and, you know, you couldn't see. And he was going through the chocolate milk and he was just kind of following along like a log, just touching it. And then he touched a thing that was living. With the, uh, the, um, yes, it wasn't him. There was uh, one of the other divers, Eric Schmidt. So um, so they dive in pairs, uh, you know, to, for safety. And... Um, he was down, Eric was down there with his diving partner and it was so like, they literally, they could not see their hands in front of their faces, like literally. So they're, they're diving and they have their hands outstretched in front of them, which, you know, try it, try to imagine that. Um, and there, so this thing, this object comes very close to him to the point where it's probably like, you know, maybe six inches from his nose. And all of a sudden he sees eyes. And he's like, oh, my gosh, what is this, right? (laughs) And thankfully, it was a turtle, (laughs) the sea turtle. But can you imagine all of a sudden you see these big eyes about six six inches or so away from you, and you're like, okay, is this the last thing I'm going to see? Yeah. How big is this thing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think I would have had to have changed and cleaned out my diving gear. (laughs) I, you know, oftentimes we'll we'll ask an uh, author, what kind of conversations can we have as we're reading your book? But I'm thinking that after reading The Lost Forest, I mean, it could be weeks and weeks of launching investigations just around your home and your backyard and going into the backyard and saying, hey, what do you notice here? What, What kind of things make you wonder and wow that what a fun way to spend time with your kids yes absolutely you know and you can take them i mean you can do it in your backyard and that's fabulous you can also go to parks you can go to creeks you can go to the ocean you can go to the forest and just kind of make observations it's even cooler if you take the little science notebook right and you watch things over time you know, this it's coming up soon in the next couple months where spring is going to be coming mm-hmm. up, even up your way. I mean, we in Florida, it's coming closer. But um, and you could observe kind of when do certain plants come out? Right. And are those plants, do they get more sun than this one? You know, all of these different things. Um, but making observations is great, not just for science, but because, Jed, you and I both know as you get older, you're going to observe lots of different things besides science, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, let's just talk about driving the car, right? Mm-hmm. L- like you're honing your observational, you know, outlook on life um, just by starting with something fun. Yeah, yeah. And and 
what a what a way to give our kids kind of a, a step up because yes. one of the things that I'm hearing is that kids you know we're thankfully we're pushing literacy in schools and really yes. making kids aware of how important it is to be able to read but I'm hearing that that's coming at the expense of numeracy I hope I'm saying that right that kids aren't getting the push in math and um, you know and we need we need to be literate in math and we need to be literate in in the stem fields and in science and in nature and we got to be whole people we have to help our kids be (laughs) whole people yes absolutely and you know the thing is is i know i've heard people say well kids are into videos okay well kids are also into books you just have to expose them to them Mm -hmm. you know you have to take them to the library let them choose their own books um but in this book you, we actually incorporated some QR codes. Mm. So you can see the actual videos, some of the, of the scientists as they're diving. So you can actually see the underwater forest and what it looks like. Um, so this book kind of works as both, right? Like mm-hmm. we have a book, but we also have the, a video component. And, you know, I think you might start seeing some of that more in kids' books, um, especially for science, for STEM. I mean, why not? Because science is best when it's done in action, right? Yeah. And so seeing something in action can even get you more excited about it. Yeah, yeah. You seem you. I know that you you've had a love for science forever. You had a, a, a yes. science club in your in your garage. I think you when were blow- I was seven. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you were blowing things up when you became a teenager, <laughs> something like that. But right now. You, I think you have the best job in science because instead of being like a lot of scientists when, you, when you're in a lab and you're studying one thing for like your entire career or one or two mm-hmm. things, you're like going out there like a, like a science bumblebee. You're going and you're <laughs> learning about the lost forest and fossils and you're doing a lot of work with NASA and yes. you're just kind of going and you're becoming this, this science expert in like almost everything. Yeah. Well, you know, does you know why? Because I'm still that seven year old curious kid. You know, I love learning about stuff and I love sharing what I've learned. So, yep, last year I kind of became a NASA space influencer and I got to go behind the scenes in um, Kennedy Space Center and at Johnson Space Center. I got to meet the Artemis II astronauts, the four humans that are going to go the furthest, you know, away from the Earth ever. Um, and so now I'm working on sharing all that uh, for free with a lot of teachers and homeschoolers and parents. So I have a Pinterest page where you can find me. I have a bunch of, you know, the little, I mean, I will admit, I don't know a lot about Pinterest, but <laughs> I hire some who, make, who makes my cool pins. Um, but the other thing I'm going to do is I'm, I'm working on starting my own YouTube channel. So you can get these little clips. Um, and as my time as a teacher... Um, I loved doing this thing called the questions of the week, right? So parents, and I had parents who loved that because these were the dinner table questions. So I'm going to start doing that on my YouTube channel. So hopefully you invite me to come back when that's all up and I can talk about that, um, and let everybody know about it. Cause again, it'll be free, but they're great conversation starters to have with your kids and your families. And even if you don't know, because I have a lot of parents that are like, I'm not really a STEM person, and my kid loves science, and I don't know what to do, have a conversation. Just start there. Yeah, if, you don't, if you're not a STEM person and you don't know, ask your kid. Yes. Let your kid become your teacher. I mean, talk about yeah. empowering. Yes. I mean, you are your kid's first and most important teacher, and one of the greatest things you can teach our kids is that, they can teach others and exactly. they can be experts. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and maybe your kid's dying to go to the nearby museum or, you know, whatever. So when you go on family trips, maybe let your kids pick a place that they want to go to that you approve of. Don't get me wrong. Right. <laughs> you know, but, you know, look at maybe taking them to a science center or a museum or a zoo or an aquarium or something um, and just watch them. You will probably be very surprised at how excited they become. Yeah, absolutely. I, 
I just love this. I know I my my niece is a, a, a STEM genius, and she yes. loves it, and she's studying um, biomedical engineering, and I'm Whoa. so proud that's, of that's her. That's a serious major. That there, is Jess. a serious <laughs> major, and she comes and she talks to me, and it goes all the way over my head. That's why I don't have any hair left. It's too much. <laughs> But it's so cool to, to when she starts talking about this stuff, she is so excited and she becomes yes. animated. And that's what you want with your kids, to be yes. sharing those moments with them. And you're just reinforcing that, yeah, I think it's pretty cool that you like this. And I yes. love that you like this. Yeah. And the thing is, is I've had parents who listen to their kids and they're like, wow, science is cool. Like, yeah. I never learned this when I was a kid. Yeah. It's changed, people. Science has changed a lot in the way it's presented now to kids, which is fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, your website is a place where people can go to kind of like get like a, a – a degree in science because there's so many different <laughs> topics. There's crash test dummies and yep. the science of sports and everything you need to know about chemistry. And like, I have to start a page one cause I like know nothing about chemistry, but uh, <laughs> tell everybody where your website is and, and how they can get there and some of the other cool stuff they can find. Um, so you can find me on my website, Jennifer Swanson books.com. There's videos, there's free teacher guides, um, and from there, if you go to the bottom of the home page, you can see my Pinterest page, and I run a, a, a let's see a blog called STEM Tuesday with more information about books and how to use them in your classroom and homeschool. I have Steam Team books, which talks about a lot of the uh, STEM books that are coming out this year, and then of course um, my award-winning Solve It for Kids podcast, which Jed was my original co-host and he's still involved in it let's see if you can figure out how mm -hmm. um, and you can find that on solve it for kids or wherever you listen to your podcast we've had a great time talking with the dean of all things stem and steam <laughs> the author of the lost forest jennifer swanson hey admiral thanks so much for being back with us oh it's always a great pleasure thanks jed this episode is brought to you by Earthbox, the ultimate destination for discovering delicious treats you never knew existed. With over 292,000 satisfied customers, Earthbox offers a variety of boxes to suit every lifestyle. Whether you're into classic, vegan, gluten-free, or looking for protein boost, Earthbox, they have you covered. Each month, you unwrap a world of flavor with Earthbox curated selection of healthy, natural, and GMO-free snacks and beverages. From savory to sweet, there's something for everyone to enjoy. Join the thousands who have already achieved their lifestyle and health goals with Earthbox. I'm happy to let you know the folks over at Earthbox have a special deal for listeners of Reading With Your Kids. All you need to do is to go to our homepage, readingwithyourkids.com, Scroll down, click on the Earthbox banner, and save on a new subscription. Start your journey to tastier, healthier snacking with Earthbox. Before we invite our guests into the studio, I would love to invite you to visit a very special website. It's clownswithoutborders.org. Clownswithoutborders.org. This is a group that I absolutely adore. I am part of of Clowns Without Borders, and I had the honor of being part of the 2023 tour of El Salvador. I had so much fun joining with artists from all over the world to bring a smile to people who really needed it and, and, and really appreciated it, too. And we would love for you to join us as a monthly join maker. Uh, the join makers, they're a family of people just like you who love to laugh and make other people feel good. So please take a moment and visit clownswithoutborders.org and consider joining me as a joy maker. Join us right now from the beautiful city of Seattle in Washington. Our guest is here today to celebrate a whole lot. She is the driving force behind Duck Duck Books. Please welcome to the show Serena Lee. Hey Serena, how are you? Good. How are you, Dad? 
I'm really looking forward to speaking to you, Serena. Serena was um, referred to the show by one of our favorite guests, Yobi Q. So I know this is going to be a dynamic conversation. Um, can you start by telling us about Duck Duck Books? Absolutely. Yeah. So Duck Duck Books is a minority women-owned publisher of children's four books. Um, I focus on publishing you know, anything related to uh, social emotional learning themes to help parents and their kids learn these skills that are very essential in life. So what are some of I, and, uh, people are hearing social emotional and mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think we're, we're just using that term so casually as if everybody <laughs> understands what it is. And I have a feeling yeah. there's a lot of people out there go, I, I don't want to I don't want to let people know I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> no, I, I will give a little bit of personal kind of background story and maybe that would. Uh, put put it in a bit more context. So growing up, I am a Chinese immigrant, um, 1.5 generation, which means I was born overseas, came here to the States with my family in my teenage years. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in growing up in Chinese culture, you have to conform to everything. You have to do well in tests. Very much as soon as you were born, they try to, you know, make sure you know the ABCs, the one, two, threes, right? Very much just academic skills. Well, fast forward, um, I moved to the States, you know, went through college, got married, and then have a kid. And then guess what? I suffer through postpartum depression, severe postpartum depression. And it's through that journey of recovery that I realized how important it is to have skills to deal with all your own emotions, to deal with kind of to understand what's around you, more so than just whatever it's on textbooks. Whatever I was scoring A's for, my 4.0 GPA, didn't help me any bit when I was trying to understand what I was feeling. And so... You know, now that I have two daughters, I, I really want them to grow up with the skills that, you know, whether it's confidence, self-esteem, whether it's acceptance and, you know, embracing others' differences, whether it's understand the five languages of love, that love come in different forms, right? I feel all of these are, are, are my responsibility as a parent to inspire them on because I wouldn't expect that they would be able to learn it elsewhere, um, you know. So, so that, that's why I, I, I decided to start Dr. Books as a publishing company, um, really hone in on these type of themes. Mm -hmm. um, I do understand that recent years there is a, uh, perhaps a, a resurgence of this particular topic, but there aren't that many that are available in bilingual form. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I were to talk to my parents, so my children's grandparents, about love, about, you know, all of these topics regarding um, diversity and inclusion, for example, they would have no idea. They would have no understanding of what it is or even what to talk about because to them, they are still learning. Mm -hmm. So, 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 so a lot of um, our books are available in bilingual form in Spanish bilingual, as well as different versions of Chinese. So I personally have speak Cantonese, there's a Cantonese bilingual version, for example. And it's been a very helpful process for people like my parents and other families that, that, that I serve where they say, hey, I'm actually learning something new as I was reading to my kids too. Yeah. You, you said a lot of things that I think are really important. One of them, you, you just um, mentioned mm -hmm. that, you know, you see this as your responsibility to teach these skills to your kids. I, I'm, yes. I'm hearing from others that it's like, well, no, the, the schools, kids can learn that stuff in the schools. <laughs> yes. I, I do understand that it, there is a little bit of truth to it. And, you know, and, and kids do learn a lot in schools, right? We honestly, for the teachers that are out there, um, we don't thank them enough. We don't pay them enough <laughs> to, 
to do what they do to make sure our kids turn out useful to society. Um, but I, I would say, though, is there's nothing that compares with that those first words coming from your parents' mouth, right? Um, because think about a child as he or she grows up. Parents or, I guess, families are the closest to him before he even gets steps into schools. And so I will use an example of just using love languages, right? Mm -hmm. If they are not getting, if they don't feel they're getting like unconditional love from the parents, they end up growing up as a people pleaser. They end up growing up thinking they need to earn others' love. And they will end up going down this path, this rabbit hole of doing a lot of things that may not be really that beneficial to themselves just so that they can feel love so so i would say it's you know yes they can learn and continue to learn throughout their journey in life but that initial kind of initiation by the parents by the caretaker uh, it's it's ultimately very very important so that's why i think you know it's never too early to learn about social emotional skills right it's not stuffed to learn about social emotional skills it is a life essential skills to mm -hmm. make them a better person so that they can face whatever comes their way as they grow older yeah well, that's what i believe in you are preaching to the choir here i <laughs> we one of the things that we've said over and over here on the podcast is parents you are your child's first and most important teacher. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And and especially when it comes to learning that they are loved unconditionally, that they don't have to jump through hoops to, to earn our love. It's we love our kids. I think that is so very, very, very important. Um, so so how do your books help parents deliver that message and reinforce that message? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say it's my books are, you know, somewhat a little bit different than your conventional board books, right? And as in that, it's not necessarily teaching basic concepts that, that are also important. And there are many, many great books out there that are well designed for that. Um, but my books are really meant to have that conversation between the child and the parents as they go through the pages. There are different ways to approach my books, depending on how old um, the child is. So if they are just born, for example, my books are very vibrantly colored. Um, it, it really captures their attention. Um, but as they get a little bit older, say they are between two to three years old, as they have those first words, we as parents, we know that, you know, once you pick up a book and they like it, you end up reading it a millionth time, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so having all these sentences that are essentially drill into their brains of, you know, these phrases that they can repeat to themselves later. Um, I remember my daughter will be reading and she can recite the whole book even though she doesn't read. And so, and so having these phrases that are available at the parents' disposal that they can repeat to their children, even though they didn't born learning how to say, I will love you with my actions, I will love you with my words, right? Like those things. Um, it it, it equips parents with these, um, this tool, as you will, um, to, to, to repeat those positive reinforcement, those phrases to the children. And then as I get older, perhaps between three to five years old, when they have enough vocabulary to have a conversation, that's when I would say the real, you know, dialogue can really happen, right? The parents could use the real life example. Everything is super relatable. Um, and, and, and those are great ways to not just read, but using this book as a conversation starter. And that's why, Jed, I really love your podcast in a, in a sense that I, I love your mission, right, to allow parents and children to bond with each other. And I see that kind of interaction of that reading, of having a conversation 
as as part of that bonding experience. Well, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's why I I started the podcast. I've I've said repeatedly. I know that the relationship <laughs> I have with my kids, who are now mm-hmm. twenty seven and thirty, and uh, oh, it, wow. those 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 relationships were built on a foundation. Um, that started when they were curled up on my lap and we were reading yeah. together. And we did yeah. s- simple things like, what do you think is going to happen next? So what do you think about what just happened? Letting them know that this person that they rely on, that loves them, um, uh, cares about what they think. I, th- I think that's yeah. such an empowering thing. Yes, yes. And, and personally, you know, I see this bonding experience, this reading, right? Almost, I, I needed it as much as a child needs it, mm-hmm. right? Um, kind of going back to uh, my 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 journey of recovering from postpartum depression. I, by the way, I'm really vocal about mental health because mm-hmm. that's part of the that's part of the thing with social and emotional learning too. It's um, growing up, nobody talk about mental health in my culture. Um, and then I have to learn it the hard way. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so w- w- when 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 one person is suffering from depression, they have a hard time bonding with kids. Mm-hmm. Um, they have a hard time seeing the joy in life, right? Um, and so reading became kind of something, the only thing I and my child was looking forward to every day. It's the only constant in our days when, when, when my days were the darkest. And so, and and so that's why I I think I see it as in, you know, reading when a parent is reading to the child, it's not just doing them a favor, it's doing themselves a favor as well, right? Those became the core memory that a child can grow up in and say, hey, I remember every night I would curl up, you know, on my daddy's lap, on my mommy's lap. And we will read his books, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah. I'm, you know, you mentioned a couple of times uh, it, it, your culture and in your culture that we don't talk about mental health. That certainly was the way I grew up. And I'm not yeah. Chinese. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> you know, things things are changing here in the States. Mm-hmm. I'm imagining they'll, they'll be changing in different cultures. But how, if, if you weren't talking about mental health, what was it that got you through, other than discovering the joy that you felt reading with your kid, what was it that helped you get through that really dark time in your life? You know, um, funny thing is, I would say my child actually saved me. Um, now, one thing is, I, I did mention, you know, um, kind of going through reading, being a, a coping mechanism, something that get me through the end of the day and perhaps to the next day, day by day, Mm -hmm. right? But one time I remember I was curling up on the floor. I was crying. I don't even remember what I was crying about. And at that time, my two-year-old, she came up to me and she put her hand on my shoulder and she said, Mommy, it's okay. Now, I've never heard those words coming out from her mouth. And I actually didn't even think she spoke. She she had a delay in speech, uh, much like a lot of kids born during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And she said that. And I looked at her. And at that moment, I felt like she is so much wiser, so much older than me. And then I realized, hey, maybe all these books that we've been reading, not necessarily my books, of course, um, have had an impact in her in her brain that she knows in this situation, right? The Mm -hmm. appropriate thing to say would be that. And, you know, I wouldn't even know what to do, right? Uh, If, say, my friend is crying, right? Sometimes I feel like I don't even know how 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 to approach them appropriately. And here you are, my two year old, Mm -hmm. that's telling me it's okay, telling me to breathe, right? Um, so yeah, so, so, so I would say that's probably my, my core memory in Mm -hmm. a way Mm -hmm. of how that has helped me. Yeah. Well, that, that is a beautiful, beautiful story. And it's just, um, 
a real demonstration of the power of love and the power of that bond. Um, mm-hmm. that, that love that you had for each other was, was stronger than the depression that was trying to take over. Yeah. Yeah. What a beautiful story. <laughs> hey, you know, your your website is great. There's lots of books um, that, that folks can buy individually, and you mentioned that they're in multiple languages. I, I also yeah. see that there's um, a, a book club feature that, that you offer. Yes. Yes, yes. So the book club is a subscription um, that people can sign up, and it's very, very affordable. I actually – kept it as affordable as I can possibly make it. It's only $9 per delivery. So every three months, you will get a hand-picked book that aligns with our mission. It may be our book. It may not be our book. It may be other publishers' book. We do regularly support other um, minority-owned publishers um, around the country. And um, I personally, I do editing and uh, my team does design for some of the the other wonderful authors out there, and so we'll support their books as well. Um, so yeah, it's a great way for parents to feel like, hey, you know, there's so much options out there. Um, they might be getting uh, a little tired looking at all the options of what to buy, and just sign up for this, and their kids will get a brand new book in the mail every three months um, until they cancel, and yeah. it can be canceled at any time. Well, that certainly is affordable, and I. I can absolutely relate to that, you know, being overwhelmed by choices and not being able yeah. to make a choice because it's like too many choices to make. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so uh, we have a lot of families actually signing up for our Chinese um, book club, our uh, Spanish book club, and, you know, and, and we will do the shopping for them. We make sure the books are high quality that are well made, that are free of mistakes, right? And 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 they get, you know, say if you sign up for the Spanish book club, you get a Spanish bilingual book every sing, uh, every three months. Yeah, and I really love that. I, you know, it it makes sense that if you are in um, a family where your grandparents, the 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 the, the um, grandparents' native language isn't English, it makes yeah, perfect yeah. sense to have those books available, I think it is a a, a blessing for our kids if we're introducing them to different languages at a very young age because more languages a kid can learn, the better they are, the better, you know, the more people they can communicate to, the more opportunities they're going to have as an adult. And learning languages, I can tell you this from personal experience, Learning languages as a kid is a whole lot easier than it is as an old man. <laughs> it certainly is. Their brain, really, you can unlock almost like a whole new different territory. Yes. Um, you know, yeah, my daughter is in a Mandarin and Spanish immersion school right now. And, you know, if you were, we have people, you know, at the restaurant asking her a question in Spanish, she will respond back in Spanish without even knowing what she's speaking in Spanish. Because to her, it's just, oh, it's, you know, when yeah. I hear this type of question, this is what I would answer. So That's, it just makes sense for them. That's wonderful. Well, I, I, I'm not fluent in Spanish. I can get by. And I can perform on yeah, stage in Spanish. Yeah, learn together. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I've also, I, I know a little bit of Mandarin. Oh, wow. I, Very uh, impressive. Ni hao, she she. <laughs> ni hao. Ni hao, she she. And wa ai ni. Oh, yes. I love See, you. See, that's the thing. Is I, 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 yes, I love you. It's like, you know, uh, um, it's so natural, perhaps. Mm-hmm. you know, for us in the Western countries to say it, but it's so unnatural, so unnatural for mm-hmm. Chinese parents. I still wanted to get my parents to say that more regularly. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it is a learning process, even for Chinese people, mm-hmm. <laughs> for words like that. Yeah. So good yeah. job, good job. Well, it's, I'm so proud of you, Jeff. Well, thank you, <laughs> thank you. We, we've we hosted um, international students in our home, and a number of them have have been from China. And um, mm-hmm. one of one of my daughters from China taught me um, what I asked her. I said, how do you say I love you? And she taught me what I need. Mm-hmm. And then I said, I said, I wanted to know so I could say it, what I need. And she said, don't, don't, don't say that. 
Because there's a, that romantic gesture. I, that's yeah. yes, yes. yes. So I said, well, you, yes. you knew. What, <laughs> anyways, hey, I also want to talk to you. <laughs> You're involved with my friend Yobi Q, um, developing yes. an app that I think could be really useful for both authors and schools and daycare centers yes. and after-school programs. Please tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so the backstory there was, you know, for me, um, not only am I really passionate about writing, but ultimately my 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 goal is to, um, you know, be the publisher, be the platform to allow other voices of color, right, to authentically tell their story. And it just come about that Yobi had this wonderful idea, and she's the pioneer of the self-publishing um, community. And she said, hey, we have this challenge, this age-old challenge of schools cannot really find authors, right? And authors can't really get into schools. How about we build a platform that would connect them? And I'm like, you know, wonderful idea, me and my day jobs with all those skills that are just here, like ready, ready to help. Um, so we co-founded this platform called bookandauthor.com. It's a platform where authors, schools, bookstores can connect with each other more easily, um, um, whether it's authors offering their school visits or bookstores looking for a particular genre, discovering new authors. Um, so it's going to be this wonderful ecosystem, this literary connection, this gateway um, for everyone involved in the industry um, to to discover each other yeah. uh, without any middleman. Well, that is, I think, is going to be a, a tremendous um, tool for authors in schools and, uh, as, as you mentioned, bookstores. As somebody who's been presenting educational magic shows at schools for over 35 yeah. years, I know the, the, the most difficult thing um, is connecting with the schools and getting getting booked Um it, mm -hmm. it was yeah. easier in the old days where I could take an envelope and fill it with some paper and, you know, letter of recommendation, a little blurb about myself, and it would arrive at a school. And it, it seemed like, you know, schools could sit down, a principal or a librarian could sit down and, and take the time to consider it. Now there's so much out there, and, you know, s schools uh, and principals and librarians are being bombarded, bombarded by thousands of emails yeah. a week yeah. and they can't even open them all and so it makes connecting um so very very difficult and um this seems like a really neat way um uh to to make those connections so how's it going to work if there's a, a school teacher out there a librarian that's listening to the mm -hmm. podcast what, yeah. what's the first step what uh, other than going to book com? what's going to happen next yeah, I'll give a real life example. For example, I, I'm a librarian. I am looking to put together an event for June or for May or for April. And 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 I just know that I have these dates open. I don't know who I'm going to book. And I'm open to receiving proposals from people that fit my criteria. And so um, as a librarian, I can post a request for proposal mm -hmm. right on the, onto the platform. And you, Jed, a wonderful speaker, a performer, you know, a, an artist, right, who has all these experience and portfolio. Now, instead of stuffing the envelope mm -hmm. and sending to the librarian, um, and you can now respond to that request for proposal with your material, right, and your pricing. And so then the librarian can go and select and book directly with you. And then off you go. You can go and visit that school. Um, so, so, so basically, it's it's a it's a great way for schools and 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 institutions that are open to receive proposals to say they are open. And when they are not open and they're not ready, they don't have to. Yeah. Um, and meanwhile, you as the wonderful you know um, 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 artist and and author and speaker. You now know, oh, there is a school off across the country that's looking for a, you know, a speaker during those days, and I happen to be available. Or discover schools locally to you that you have not connected with mm -hmm. that are also open to booking. So 
it's making it a lot more efficient um, for you to do your job so you don't have to spend all that time trying to figure out who should you send to mm -hmm. and perhaps wasting material in the mail. Yeah. No, I, I it, it, it's a fantastic idea. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know as a, as a librarian, I would want to receive the information when I need it. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, I know a lot of that. I, I still get an occasional call from someone who got a flyer from me years ago. <laughs> Actually, decades ago at this point, but you know, it, but but that it sits in in a drawer somewhere, and maybe they find it, maybe yeah. they don't find it. But it's like, hey, I need something in May. I'm looking to book something right now, and 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 I I I just I, I think it's fantastic, and I yeah, I think, and they can see your video, they can see your, they can listen to your podcast because you can link it all up in your profile. Oh. And and and, mm -hmm. and if you're an author, the same thing. Just go to bookandauthor.com, and there's an easy sign-up process. There is a very easy sign-up process. Um, we vet everyone that goes onto the platform for the safety and security of everyone that's involved, right? So you know if a librarian is posting a job, it is a real job and not from a scammer. Uh -huh. <laughs> same thing the other way around, you know, making sure that, you know, everyone that's on the platform is a legitimate human being. And this platform launches mid-April, um, so it's coming right up in about a month. Um, and yeah, so it, once it launch, but right now, you know, anyone that's interested can go on the site and put in your email so that you can be notified when we launch. Well, that's fantastic. Um, wow, we've covered so much here today, Serena. Um, please remind everybody where they can go to find out more about Duck Duck Books and, and also how they can be part of Book and Author. Yes, so you can follow Duck Duck Books at Duck Duck Books or Book and Author at Book and Author um, on, on all the major social media platforms um, as well as the website. Awesome. We've had a really fun time talking about a whole lot of different things with our guest, the founder of Duck Duck Books, Serena Lee. Hey, Serena, thanks so much for being with us. No, thank you for your time. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Reading With Your Kids and will join us for the next exciting episode of the show. Until then, we would love for you to connect with us on social media, facebook.com slash reading with your kids, at reading with your kids on Instagram and TikTok, at Jedly Magic on Twitter. And we have a great YouTube channel you and your kids would love. It's youtube.com slash reading with your kids. On our channel, you can listen to every episode of the podcast, but more importantly, you can find two spin-off projects that we're really excited about. Drawing with your kids. This series brings you lessons from some renowned artists and illustrators teaching you and your kids how to draw some of their favorite, most beloved characters. You can also check out our STEM is Family Fun project. This is a real exciting project that will be relaunching uh, in the very near future. We have collaborated with uh, folks at the San Diego Children's Discovery Museum, with Children's Museum Houston, the National Children's Museum, authors and experts from all over the world introducing you to great STEM activities you can do in your home with things that you can find around your home. You, you got to check it out. It's at youtube.com slash reading with your kids. And we'd love for you to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. You can check out our blog, download our free online magazine, visit our Reading With Your Kids Certified Great Read Wall of Fame. Wow, there's so much to do there. There really is so much to do there. And if you're an author, you absolutely want to visit readingwithyourkids.com to find out how you can be a guest here on the podcast. It's fun. It's easy. It gives you the chance to tell thousands of people about your fantastic children's book. And it doesn't cost a thing. Check it out today, readingwithyourkids.com. want to thank the folks who helped to make today's show so wonderful. Of course, we want to thank our guest, Jennifer Swanson, our Dean of All Things STEM and STEAM, and Serena Lee. Also want to thank our great sponsors, Tim Wright's Toby Baxter, The Adventures of Toby Baxter series. Book three is coming out soon. 
And, of course, we want to thank our folks, our friends at Earthbox. Go to readingwithyourkids.com and scroll on down to the Earthbox banner to save on a new subscription. I want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Chris Doherty, Rory Grady, Skylar Strauss, Nick Warner, Kyoko Ito, Kayla Newland, Kristen Barrett, Cindy Swan, Hannah Rose. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to us today. And thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place. And you do that every time you read with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next episode of Reading With Your Kids.